I'm excited to welcome onto the first time facilitated podcast, Misha Globerman. Misha, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. Misha, it's funny, I was just reflecting on before this call, how I know of you. And it's LinkedIn, LinkedIn again. So I follow Michael Bungay Stenya. I've interviewed mm -hmm. him. He's been a previous guest on the show. And he doesn't promote a lot that does that. <clears throat> he doesn't promote a lot of work that's average. He promotes the really good stuff. And yeah. he, put a, he put a post on LinkedIn, I think at the beginning of COVID when everything was hitting, everyone was moving virtual, that was promoting one of your articles on how to host a cocktail meeting over Zoom. Yeah. And I think, I was like, okay, you know, what does this guy know? Clicked it and was just converted. I'm like, who is this Misha guy? <laughs> like the level of detail you went, you went into on that article was amazing. And um, so I just wanted to start off with that and just say that's how I founded you and connected with you. Can you share with our listeners, though, I guess you could share what inspired that article, but a bit more about your story, setting the context uh, for sure. where that came from. Um, so that article, also I should say the article is how I come to know you, too, because I think someone emailed me and they're like, oh, I saw your article. I read about it in the flip chart. And I was like, the flip chart? What's that? And they're like, oh, it's this great forum. So it's, in fact, that article brought us together in kind of mm -hmm. two directions, which was really nice. Um, you want to know about the cocktail party, about the article and the... Party? Is that we can the... start with that. Yeah. I mean, that, that was awesome. I mean, it was in the early days of COVID and um, I, I'd been running a lot of virtual events in those first few days. And I'm not someone who's been a big expert on Zoom. So like many of us, um, I was like, oh, I guess I got to figure out this Zoom thing. Like I'd used it a bit, but I hadn't really. And like many of us, I was sort of skeptical. I was like, oh, you can't, you can't build meaningful connection online. But as soon as COVID hit, I was like, oh, that's kind of my job. Because my job previously is to among other things, help people build meaningful connections and meetings and conferences and stuff like that. And I thought, well, I guess I got to start figuring out how to do that on Zoom. And uh, like many of us, I feel like I'm just telling a story so many of us had. It was like many of us were like, oh my God, you can, you can do a lot here. This is really good. You can do a lot. And I, I started doing, um, when the pandemic hit, all of my work disappeared. And I was like, this is great. Like I'm, I have all this free time. And um, for whatever reasons, I wasn't too worried. I don't know why. But I was like, I was like, there's just so much opportunity to do interesting stuff. So I was doing all these events to try to get people um, forming meaningful connections online and using the skills I had as a facilitator to get people to talk about important things. And, stuff. and as I was doing that, my uh, my birthday was coming up, and I was thinking like, I can, I guess I'm not going to have a birthday party this year. I mean, I'm a grown man. I don't have to have a birthday party every year. I usually do, but you know, I can skip it. And I was like, I kind of could do it online. And then it occurred to me, we think all so much about the upsides and downsides of the virtual stuff. It occurred to me that every year on my birthday, um, I usually have a party. And one of the things I always feel when I have a party is I'm sort of sad. I'm sad that um, so many of my friends are in different cities. And I think when I have the party, I'm like, most of the people I really love aren't actually at this party. I mean, not that I don't love people in Toronto where I live, but, you know, and, and uh, you know, my, my wife would always say, like, maybe one year you could have a special party and people could fly in from all over. And I'm like, I don't, want, I don't want my friend to fly in from Switzerland to come to my birthday party. But I was like, oh, on Zoom, you can, you can just do it. I could have a party where everybody, you know, comes from all over the world. So I was so excited to do that. And I started thinking about um, how parties work and what you can do on Zoom. And it seemed to me that the number one thing that happens at parties that you can't do on Zoom. So I was doing lots and lots of stuff with breakout rooms on Zoom. And I was like, oh, you can create all this intimacy and all this meaning, all this connection of breakout rooms on Zoom. But what you can't do is um, what happens at parties is let people move around, you know? So, so mostly people were having sort of like, at that point, people were having like drinks on Zoom and drinks on Zoom would be like 25 people on one screen. And I was like, that's not a party. Like a party isn't 25 people having one conversation like if you ever went to a party and it was just 25 people standing in a circle taking turns talking you'd be you would just like walk right out the door right mm -hmm. so i was like well part of it's breakouts part of it's getting people into small groups and that helps but then also at parties i was like people move between groups and zoom doesn't want you to do that uh, this is a very long answer. Is that okay? Um, no, no, it's great. I think everyone's like right. hanging on for the yeah. detail. Like, how did you so do Zoom it? So Zoom doesn't want you to do that. It doesn't want you to. Um, Zoom's everything about Zoom is like baked into Zoom is this incredibly structured, hierarchical, top down. Like in the meeting, there's like one host. If it's a thousand person meeting, there's one person in charge of everybody. I'm like, it's like antithetical to everything I do as a facilitator. Like so many structures baked into Zoom. It's like they don't want me to run the kinds of meetings that I want to run, which is where people are 
self-determined, where hierarchies are flat, all those kinds of things. So I started trying to figure out, is there a way that you can have breakout rooms in Zoom and let people move around between them? And, uh, and I found out there was. And basically the way you do it, it's a real hack. Like you're not, you're not exactly supposed, you know, is if you make, um, this is the hot tip for, for, if you make every person in the meeting a co-host, then they can, and even then it's tricky. They can't just go into a breakout room. You have to put them into breakout rooms yourself as the host. But then as co-hosts, they can then move around between breakout rooms. They can move between them. They can see who's in them, which is amazing for a party. Uh, and they can move about freely. Now they also have all the powers of co-hosts too. So it's also scary because they, they can screen share. If co-hosts can screen share, they can kick people out of the meeting. I mean, I wouldn't do this with like a bunch of people I didn't know or that you didn't have some connection with. But you get them all in there. So I was like, this is great. And then I was like, oh, I could have the kind of party I always want to have which is that I think that um, I think that one thing that's happened during the pandemic and taking things online is that we take the thing online and also like because we're starting from scratch we can fix the things that we don't like we can make it different so I always thought like ah, cocktail parties are sort of so-so like they could use a little more structure <laughs> they could use people could use a little more help so so we did that so what I did was I we did it in a structured way so people came in so first of all, I made a bunch of room names. I, I put them in a Google Doc that were just the um, numbered rooms. And I was like, there's the gazebo, and there's the porch, and there's the ditch, and there's oh, the garage, and there's all these different yeah. places. There was, I think, a trophy room. I mean, it's like, you know, I was bringing anything. And then um, <laughs> we had people come in, and the first thing we had, we had them talk to each other, and I did some sort of icebreaker stuff and had them talk to about what they, what they wanted from the party and how they were feeling, all this sort of stuff. But then what we had them do is I had people say, look, what kind of conversation are you hoping to have? What are you hoping to talk about? What are you hoping to not talk about? Is there a sort? Have them think about that. And then what we had them do is we had them go into the Google Doc and sort of say, okay, my name's Steve. I'm going to be in room three. And I really want to talk about, I want to talk to people about what's happening with the pandemic and the science of that. And then someone else is like, you know, I, I'm, you know, whatever. I, want to, I don't want to talk about that at all. I really want to just talk about video games. And people would just name all the different topics and populate the Google Docs. And then we put them in the breakout rooms and then boom, everyone then moves around in the rooms. And all of a sudden, people are in these rooms and they're all talking to people about things they want to talk about. They found common topics and people, some people were in big groups, some people were in little groups, some people spent the whole time in one group, some people moved around between groups, some people um, saw people they hadn't seen in 15 years and like just went into a room alone and just talked to them and, and all that stuff happened in this uh, virtual space. And it was such a pleasure. And, and, and what was so nice to me was seeing all the different ways that people could do it, that there wasn't sort of one way to be. It could be big group, little group. Some people only talked to people they didn't know. Some people talked only to people they did know. Some people moved between groups, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And all those options were available to people. And it was uh, really delightful. Really happy. And for me, an incredibly, it was in some ways a very gratifying birthday party. And in some ways, as I think you know, as a facilitator, I got to like, not actually be in the experience, but got to like do the work of hosting it. You know? Yeah, I was actually going to ask about that because I know even when I think back to birthday parties that I've hosted, there's always like all that pressure on you. And I, I think yeah. being, being that person also having to like dictate the terms, the Google Docs. Um, I don't know if you find this as well. Uh, I know when I'm in, in Zoom calls and I'm putting into breakout rooms and I'm just sitting there in the main room, I'm like, what the heck is going on in these rooms? Like, were you very curious? Did you just want to pop in? The main in? room like, is a weird place in a Zoom yeah. call. Um, well, often if I'm doing facilitations and stuff like that, one thing that I'll sometimes do, and I, I'll let people know before, is I'll go and I'll pop into the rooms. Like if they're going to be there for a long time, I'll say, I'm going to put you in groups. And just, you know, I'm going to pop in and pop out. Like uh, at my birthday party, I'd sometimes go join the conversation. But sometimes even in groups, I'll just go and I'll go with my camera off. Like they'll see that I'm there, but I'll go and I'll listen. Or sometimes I'll go with my camera on, like whatever. But you can, you can go into the breakout rooms and see what's going on. But yeah, it's different. You don't feel the... It's like the opposite of like when you're facilitating, you feel all that buzz and electricity. Yeah. You just feel like, boom, alone. Boom. That's it. Or even worse, it's you alone. And then it's like the one person who came to the meeting late who needs technical <laughs> support. Right. And you're just alone <laughs> with that person. The person who like got logged out and now they're logged back in and they're like, you know, that's terrible. There's, there's, there are some really interesting dynamics. I was in a call a couple of weeks ago and I was putting it into breakout rooms and I was put in, like the host purposely put me in with a real introvert, someone very quiet. 
for a right. specified period of time, about 10 minutes. And um, Misha, honestly, the conversation ended after about three and I'm oh. like, yeah, it was really, I was like trying to like talk and ask questions and they were very reserved, very quiet. And I was thinking, okay, trying to take this a bit meta, like, you know, what should I do? Do we just then go back into the main room? Like what's the, and there's no real kind of um, Zoom etiquette on that. What do you think? What would you do in a situation? I mean, I'm talking to you now. I don't think there'd be any moment of silence uh, if you're in a breakout room. But the, Did they give you a prompt? Yeah, there were prompts. And the question, we talked about the questions. We did all the activities. I think in 10 minutes, if I'd had someone a little bit more talkative, it would have been perfect. But yeah. the time and, yeah, I was, I mean, I kept it going because I could just, I can keep talking. But yeah. I mean, I was thinking maybe, maybe this guy isn't enjoying this so much. Should we just call it? Are you thinking what you would do as a facilitator if you were running it or, or just what you would do as a participant in that situation? Both. A bit of both. Yeah. I mean, as a participant, yeah. I was having to scramble and think about it. Um, I didn't know that that was a strategic move. She, the facilitator told me afterwards. She's like, oh, by the way, I, I specifically put you in that room with that person. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, one thing I wouldn't do as a facilitator is put people in rooms together for secret reasons that I didn't share with them. That's yeah. something I probably would not do myself. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's a terrible thing to do, but but right off the bat, it's like, oh, they're she's doing something. She's doing some like puppet master stuff that I wouldn't do. Um, yeah. That said, I mean, I'm also maybe I'm being skeptical, but part of me thinks like if it's a prompt that only gives three minutes of conversation, even with a quiet person, I'm I'm like, man, that doesn't sound like it was a really good prompt. Um, mm. But I don't know. I mean. Um, yeah, it's funny. I haven't thought about that. Usually I find people, I mean, usually what I find when people come back is that no matter how much time people you give people, they say they wanted more time. And, and, I always, and also people underestimate it. So one thing, actually, having just said that I don't do puppet master stuff, I try to, <laughs> as much as possible, I try to be like as transparent and as honest with my participants, participants as I can. And one instance that I can think of where I don't, um, and I don't, is that I, I typically under tell them how long they're going to be in a breakout for like unless there's a timer like if like if, like if i think they're going to be in there for 10 minutes i say I think, i'm going to put you in breakouts for about seven minutes so i'm not lying uh, about seven or yes. minutes. i think yes. everybody thinks oh seven minutes that's a long time but but and then you bring them back at 10 minutes and they're like that wasn't enough time so it might have to do with the prompts i don't know i don't know i mean if you're in that situation you're a facilitator so you should also be able to yeah, I was, I was. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then, yeah. So I'm still thinking about it, but I, I do like your idea on the, the level of prompt. And I'll say another thing actually in terms of yeah, that, in terms of you. one thing I do, one thing I'm aware of as a facilitator is that when I'm doing facilitations on Zoom, hmm. rarely if ever would I put people in pairs. I do it a lot in um, live stuff, but I don't in Zoom. And one reason why is, is because of the thing that you described is that when, not, not exactly that, but when people are in pairs, they're completely alone. And, and depending on the nature of the group, but if it's like, say, a medium-sized group of people who don't know each other very well, I feel that's not safe yeah. for people. Like, like, you could be in there with someone who harasses you. You could be in there just with someone who's like really super socially awkward. You could be in there with someone who... And I don't think... I want to make people a little safer than that. And my inclination is to think that like, so I wouldn't have put you in that. You'd be that with that person and another person at, yes. the, at the least. And I, so I think, I think pairs are okay on Zoom if it's like an intact, you know, a small group that's an intact team that really know each other. But in a context like the one it sounds like you're doing, I would, I would, I would never intentionally put people in pairs for, for precisely those kinds of reasons. Yeah, that's really good. And I love that we're talking at this deep level of detail on these virtual programs. The other thing that I noticed as well, so um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you see I'm, I'm holding a microphone today. And I have a microphone because the audio quality is better, but I'm also noticing that it gives me a level of status. When people get into calls with me and I've got this microphone, it's like, Leanne is the interviewer, you're the person. So I've, I've got to think about how I kind of move the microphone or not have it in, in the visual. Yeah. So um, Misha, just a bit about your sort of background and the work that you do. Have you always been interested in creating great connections? Like where did you sort of discover that you wanted to, to work in this field? What's, that is a really a gradual, uh, I can't even, it was like a very circuitous path with lots of ins and outs and ups and downs. I, um, I don't know. I, did, <laughs> I, I think I always, I, I taught, I, I ran, a, I was very, I was very involved in improv theater when I was a young person and 
And the thing I learned from improv theater most of all was I started, um, I went to university and I, they, they had an, an improv group and I auditioned to get in and I didn't get in. And I thought, this is one of those moments in life where they're like, oh man, that bad luck was so good. So had I gotten in, I probably <laughs> just would have done improv, but because I didn't get in, I was like, oh, I'll start my own group. That'd be fun. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll teach some people to do improv and then we'll do improv together. What I discovered was that I loved teaching people to do improv and I loved, and it allowed me to think about it in a way that was really different from just doing it. And I loved being in that kind of role of teacher and helping people listen to each other. And so I think that was part of it. And I think, I think years later when I got out of school for a while, I missed it and I kept trying to do improv and it was never fun. And I realized like, oh, I don't miss doing improv. I miss helping people connect with each other in this meaningful way. And so that became more what I tried to do. That's I one. Love, I did a bunch yeah. of other, I ran a residence association and I, I don't know, I did a bunch of stuff. It's been a, I was a software developer for a long time. So it's been a weird Wow. Path. So how long have you been? Yeah, that is a weird path. That's cool. How long have you been uh, running your own show for? Uh, as long as I've had a job for about one year of my life. I'm not good at having a boss. It turns out you can ask my last boss. It's not <laughs> my strong point. So I've been a self-employed something. Um, for almost my whole life, which is, which is tricky when you're working in organizations, like a thing that happens to me sometimes or I'm teaching a class and people are like, oh yeah, you know, I was having a, I was having a problem in our, you know, I don't know, in my performance review. And I'm like, I guess I know it. You know, <laughs> people are like, you know, I was talking to my boss and I was like, I guess I remember what having a boss is like <laughs> yeah. me to relate to that situation. Oh, I love that. I really like what so, yeah, you said. For a long time. Yeah. Well, good on you. That's really, that's really exciting. Yeah, like and so the topics that you really focus on are things like communication and negotiation. I've got the, I love yeah. the, the title you gave to this, how to talk to people about things. It's very simple, but we, you know, you, when you hear it, you get it. What kind of things do you cover in those, in those workshops? A mix of stuff. I mean, people come, there's a bunch of versions of that workshop too, but the, the most, the one I've been doing for the longest time is a public version of the workshop. People come on their own, of their own volition. Sometimes they're employers pay for them. Sometimes they pay their own, usually sometimes they pay their own way. Occasionally their employers send them, but pretty, pretty infrequently. So it's lovely. There's people who are there for their own reasons. And I would say people show up about kind of 75% for work stuff and 25% for personal stuff. And then by the time the class is over, it's probably more like half and half. Yeah. Right. Um, so it's really a mix of things. It's a lot of, uh, the stuff that I'm most interested in is helping people in the day-to-day -day relationships that matter to them, and and the, both personal and professional, um, but especially the professional relationships that matter. Um, uh, and figuring out ways to have those. Um, so it's how you get along with your how you get along with your family, how you get along with your boss, how you get along with your employees, how you get along with your coworkers, like all of those kinds of things, and looking at all the ways in which. Um, how important those relationships are and how important those conversations are and also how I think people sort of come in thinking like oh what matters is this sort of one really big conversation that like I have something that big like once a year or twice a year but yeah. I'm more interested in like the everyday and how to be more uh fully present and fully authentic and like just all the stuff that goes on so if and I think also... that's what people end up discovering as they take the class is they kind of like, they're like, oh, it's everything. It's not just kind of that one big thing. Yeah, it is. And back to, you know, Stephen Covey wrote that book years ago, Seven Habits, but he talks about just that emotional bank account and now every day you've got to sort of deposit into those relationships. Yep. Um, you're right, because people do want quick wins. I think they're going to come to a workshop, walk away an hour later, and it's like problem solved, relationship fixed, but it is more sort of long term than that. So if you could offer up some tips or some suggestions for listeners that are wanting to sort of like really target a relationship and, and build that over time, you talked about authenticity. What else can we do um, to improve? I know that's a over time? big question. I think, I think one of the biggest things I would think over time I mean, there's a thousand things, but I think yeah. one of the biggest things over time, especially if it's long term, is to. This is something that I've sort of. I have like the newest. I should probably be giving you like the oldest, best established stuff, but the stuff that boasts in my head is the newest, yeah, least good. established stuff. So give I'll give us the new stuff. It. Yeah, yeah. The thing that I find myself talking about more and more in the workshops is this idea that a lot of the time when you're in a difficult conversation, what you need to do is zoom out. And what I mean by that is like, very often you're talking about the matter at hand. So like, um, 
you're with your boss and you're talking about some detail on the project about whether the button on the website's going to be green or red or whatever. And your boss is talking to you about it and like they're micromanaging you and this is like the fifth time they've done it. But what you're talking about is the button. But the button isn't actually the issue. You got to zoom out. And the issue is the pattern in which you feel that your boss is micromanaging you. Mm -hmm. But what happens very often is we have the, con the conversation we're having is smaller. And the thing we need to talk about is bigger. And so zooming out can mean talking about the pattern um, that this instantiates. It can mean talking about um, the relationship and how this, how this conversation fits into your relationship. Mm -hmm. It can mean talking about um, your feelings that are going on inside of you. Um, so you're sort of stepping back from the problem looking at it. And it can also mean talking about, um, about systems and systemic issues. So talking about things like racism or stuff like that or another, another form of zooming out. Um, but so very often we're kind of just talking about the thing in front of us, but if we can step back and talk about the bigger thing, we'll get more results. And usually the times to do those are different. So the time okay. to talk about your boss micromanaging you isn't the moment when you're talking about the red or green button. That what you have to do is then actually take the time to go back and your boss and say, hey, listen, I want to talk, you know, have you, I, I'd like to talk to you about this, some things in our working relationship. And, you know, one thing that I feel is that on a number of occasions recently, I felt kind of micromanaged and I want to talk to you about what's going on there and I want to kind of explore that. So being able to step back and talk about the bigger thing, especially in relationships, is really important if you can do mm. Timing is a really interesting one. And I think of past relationships and, and when people sort of have come to me and go, hey, we need to talk, that just like triggers yeah. off alarm bells. Uh, yeah. Is that what you open up with or should you just be a little we bit need more need to subtle? talk is not what I would <laughs> say. Well, one of the, so another one of the big tips we talk about a lot is that um, one thing that I believe really strongly is that when, a, when conversation, another thing that happens when conversations are going badly, I think very often people are looking at the wrong thing. So first of all, you're zooming in, you're sort of zoomed in at too fine of a thing. The other thing I think when conversations go badly um, is that the participants in the conversation haven't come to an agreement about um, what we would call like the process of the conversation as a facilitator. You so, so you're talking about the content, but you haven't actually agreed on process and process is, you know, things like, what are we talking about? When are we having this conversation? Are we having this conversation now? Uh, who's involved? Um, what are we trying to do in this conversation? Are we trying to come to a decision? Are we trying to just uh, share information? Um, is this the only time we're going to talk about this? Or you know, all those kinds of things. Mm. Our process right. issues. But very often the biggest process issue and, and process needs to be decided together. And one of the biggest mistakes we make, and especially those of us who are professionals in this, is that we think, well, I'm a process expert. So I'll, so I'll sit down with someone and I'll say, hey, we've got this big issue. Let's talk about it. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to talk about our underlying interests. Then we're going to explore some options. Then we're going to work together to find what, what I've done yeah. is I've now unilaterally imposed a process upon them. And so what they're thinking is, he's not the boss of me like why is Misha telling so so even though what I'm doing is being super duper I'm like I'm gonna I'm gonna be so collaborative I'm gonna make you use this super collaborative process doesn't work and so even we need to talk those words perfect example right that is super unilateral so yeah. can we talk uh, is collaborative we need to talk I've already decided that we need to talk. If you disagree with me, we're already, oh we're already <laughs> at odds with each other. Yeah, so once yeah. you start talking, the other person is going to be like, you're just saying words at me. I don't even think we need to talk. So you have to establish all that. Oh my gosh. So if, if you want to approach someone, rather than saying we need to talk, we say, say I'd like to talk to you. Mm. When's a good time? And when you say that, you got to be prepared for now as an answer, right? Yeah. So I'd like to talk to you. When's, I'd like to talk to you about X. Is that something you'd want to talk about? And if so, when's a good time? Now you're designing the conversation together as opposed to imposing the conversation. And it makes an enormous difference. Oh, it, yeah, gosh, this, uh, it's ringing true for me, actually, everything you're saying. Because it's because I okay. think, well, because I am a facilitator and you're right, I'm like, I'm the process person. It's like, I know the best yeah. tools and systems or you know frameworks to solve this. So let's just sit down and let's go through this process. And as you said, I'm already sort of not dominating but it's not a, a an equal conversation yeah it's a um, huge thing to watch for yeah. and one of the things yes. one of the one of the one of my favorite people on this is uh, roger shorts who wrote i don't know if he wrote a book called the skilled facilitator and it seems to me that like the central i mean there's a bunch of, it's a wonderful book but it, the central insight in there is that as facilitators most of the time very often what we're doing is 
the opposite of what we are asking our participants to do. So what we're telling our participants is be open with each other, share all the information, talk about tough issues, um, be collaborative. And then we go in as facilitators and what we are is uh, controlling, secretive, um, you know, so as an example, like that facilitator who said, oh, I'm going to put Leanne in, that, in the group with that introvert. I'm not going to tell either of them. That's exactly the kind of behavior that a facilitator doesn't want her participants to do. She has a problem. She's keeping it secret. She's solving it on her own. She's, she's, she's I mean, I'm not saying she's a villain, but like, but, but you wouldn't want your participants doing that. You would want your participants talking openly about a problem like that, not, not secretly trying to solve it without involving the parties. But she's doing that, right? So that's the stuff that Roger talks about. That's just lovely. And, and, as a, and I've really taken that to heart. And so what that means is in my facilitation, I try, and I do not always succeed, but I try to be as, as to enact the values I look for in my participants, which is, you know, to be collaborative, to be transparent, to be curious. And that's, and that's not to say that I don't pretend as a facilitator that I don't, I don't abdicate my responsibility as a facilitator. I have a special responsibility mm -hmm. and I have special expertise, but I try not to be, uh, for instance, secretive in how I exercise that expertise. Mm -hmm. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, no, I do find it difficult. And I guess the reason I started this podcast first time facilitator back in 2017 was actually a trip up to Canada, actually, where I had a, oh. an incident in a workshop, um, which I was like, how, how would people deal with this incident? Just someone not participating. And, uh, and I sort of flitted between the role of trainer and facilitator. In terms of I'm coming in to share my expertise, there is a structure and a process around this, but I want it to be a facilitative experience. And a lot of that whole conversation around facilitator and trainer can get kind of nasty. People really have strong opinions on on what those roles mean. So how do you yeah. balance? I mean, you said before that you you aren't so secretive, but where yeah. do you draw the line on like okay, giving the autonomy, the collaboration, and opening that up versus okay, well we've only got two hours here. How do I manage oh. that? Yeah. So if what you're thinking is, we've only got, only got two hours. To, so if we're running late and we've only got two hours left and we've opened a whole can of worms and I'm running a workshop. Yes. Yeah. Then the thing to say is we're running two hours late and we've opened a whole can of worms. You can literally say that. And you can then say, so what I'd like to do is talk with you guys about what we can do here. Um, yeah. There we cool. have a couple of possibilities. We could, um, we could try to cover what's come up here. We can go in a different direction. Uh, and the group can figure that out. So, so again, as opposed to kind of having the wheels just be spinning in your head and trying to solve the problem on your own. So even when I'm, when I'm, I probably do more training work than like straight facilitation work, but when I'm training, I try to be, and to be clear, 99% of the time when I'm training, we, we don't deviate from the path. I mean, we stay on the path, but yeah, be pretty clear about that. And, and again, be clear to, and, and you might even say, you know what, we, we just don't, well, then you, we don't have time for this. Then you be clear about that. You say, listen, I'm the trainer. I'm going to make that call, but be transparent about that. Don't sort of secretly try to sneak around. Secretly it try way. to like stop the conversation because you need to move on to the next thing. Yeah. If you're gonna, then you say, I'm gonna... very often I'll just get the group I'll say, listen, this, I, one thing I often do too, is there's a lot of contracting early on in a class. And so one piece of contracting I do very early on in the class is I, is I say to them, we have a lot of material to cover here. We have a limited amount of time. Um, Part of my job is I have, I have two conflicting jobs as a facilitator. One is to start really interesting conversations with you guys. And then another job, which I hate, is to stop them so that we can move on to the next yeah. thing. So one thing I'm going to be doing consistently, and it's going to break my heart every time, is we're going to be in an incredible conversation. I'm going to say we have to stop now to move on to the next thing. Are you guys okay with that? And every single person puts up their hand. Of course they do. But now you have their permission. So you've been really trans... And, and that makes it much easier because now you've made them a partner in solving the problem. So next time when that's happening, say, oh, this is one of those times that are you guys okay if we stop? Or you just make the choice and you say, I'm, I'm going to stop this now. But you make it clear as opposed to kind of being like, oh, I hope, this, I hope this conversation fizzles out on its own so I don't have to cut them off. That's where you're being secretive, you know? Yes. Oh, this is awesome. This is a great conversation. So good. Where did you learn all this? Like you mentioned uh, Roger Sch Schwartz's book. Um, yeah. Is it just through trial and error, listening to people, seeing what other facilitators do? It's a bunch of different stuff. I mean, it's watching, yeah. watching other facilitators is wonderful. Um, Roger's, I took Roger's workshop, Roger Schwartz's workshop, which is, I think they teach it in North Carolina now. It's, it's great. It's like a five day intensive workshop. I would really recommend it for everybody. It's, it's crazy too, because they don't, I went in thinking they were going to teach me. It's like, it's called the skills facilitator. 
I went in thinking they were going to teach me like some, I'd brush up on like some nuts and bolts skills about like how to flip chart things or how to do it. They teach you nothing. They teach you nothing <laughs> practical at all. all they, teach, they might object to that, but I feel that way. But all they teach you is this really deep fundamental way of being, um, which is better. Mm. So I learned that from him and I learned it from doing myself and I learned it from watching other people and watching people I like and also a lot from watching people I don't like, like being like, oh, that didn't yeah. feel good. I don't want to do that to people or that to me. Uh, so yeah, from that, I guess all those things. Mm-mm-mm. And in terms of your, you talked about the state of being that you covered for five days. That's, that's really interesting. In terms of you, you're getting into that state for running like a, a one day workshop, or it could be a two hour webinar over Zoom, whatever it is, how do you um, get yourself ready for that workshop experience? Huh. Um, I mean, some of it's basics, just self-care, like get enough sleep. And, uh, you know, if it's a big deal thing, I'll try to show up there like an hour before and have time to like have a coffee and zone out, you know, get comfortable in the space and stuff like that. I do think that like for preparing, one of the biggest things for me that I keep trying to learn is to like prepare less. And I feel like the less I prepare, the more flexible I can be. That if I spent like, when I first started doing things, I was like, I would sort of be like, I'm gonna, like, I really wanna do a great job. So I'm gonna practice and practice and like really think about all the things I'm gonna do and say, but the more you do that, the more you kind of get invested on the things you're gonna do and say. And so learning to prepare less has been helpful for me. And also it kind of feels to me like it's kind of modeling what I want my participants to think too. Like I don't want my participants to think like before you do anything, you have to practice so much that you've got everything 100% perfect and under control. That's not, so when I find myself feeling that way, I try to release that. I am not, it is not my strong suit, but it's in general. Yes, it's not my strong suit either. And I'm definitely, um, from all of these conversations, realizing a lot of it is, is letting go. I remember a yeah. workshop I ran a few years ago, um, a participant at the end of it, he was like, oh, the best time of that workshop was when you actually stuffed up. It was like on the second day, like I was trying to, I, it's like a case study. I just couldn't recall it. And he was like, oh, you, you know, actually more human then. And I was, I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Cause I'd just been playing this like professional facilitator role. Didn't oh my God. Connect. It's so, it's so important. It's so important for me. I feel that as a teacher, for sure. Like, I really, like, yeah, when I, like, mess up, like, when I, you know, someone in my class says something and I, like, interrupt them to, to like, tell them what I think they're saying. And then, like, I'll go back five minutes later and be like, who saw me do that thing, you know? Because that's important, right? You can, yeah, there's so much learning in that. And again, that's relaxing if you think, oh, man, if I make a mistake, that's great news, you know? Yeah. That's a, if you can get into that mindset, and again, I, this is not my strong suit. But if you yeah. can get into the mindset where mistakes become positive, I feel like that's a kind of, that's a pretty deep superpower if you can do that. Mm, I think so. It is. Now, Misha, I want to talk about an, a really cool event that you run in Toronto and it's, I was listening to a bit of your podcast yesterday, all the different stories. So it's called what the trampoline hall. Trampoline hall lecture series. Yes. Tell us about it. We've been doing it for so long. Oh my God. So long. We've been doing it for like, I think it's a, almost a thousand years now. We've been doing it. <laughs> actually for really almost 20 years. I think it started in 2001. Uh, it was started by my friend Sheila Hetty, who is a uh, now fairly well-reputed writer at the time, a young up-and-coming writer. And uh, it's a lecture show. Uh, she started it. I run it now, I guess. Um, I host it. And it's a show in a bar. People come and they give lectures. The rule is that they cannot lecture on a subject in which they are professionally expert. But, but they're often very smart about the topic. It's not like a parlor game. They, they work hard on the lectures. They prepare them. They come in, they give their talk. And then after the talk, and, and after the talk, we're in the bar, uh, we take questions from the audience. And my job is to introduce the show, kind of set the tone for the show, and then um, facilitate the Q&A with the audience. And uh, it's great. It's lovely. It's sold out every show. We've done it for, it's once a month. It's sold out every show for whatever it is, 20 years. Uh, and it sort of happens at the intersection of a uh, sort of Toronto, like literary scene and visual arts scene and music scene. And, um, nice sometimes a little adjacent to the tech scene, like just different people. It's great. It's really a lot of fun. And we've been doing it for a long time. Yeah, 2001. Oh my gosh. You'd be getting really I good know. at those Q&As at the end. Have you had any, yeah. let's talk about workshops though, like, or maybe even that event. Has, have, has there ever been a time when something just hasn't gone right and you think, oh, that moment really stands out. I want to share it with our listeners because 
you know, we all go through those times. Have you ever had something that just hasn't gone right? Um, I mean, things don't go right all the time. Like at some level, like, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, know, uh, I do know. I do every know. day things don't go right, uh, yeah. you know. Um, but I think the time that most, the time I could think of that was the biggest time that thing went, thing went wrong with me when I was doing the event. This is what I was, I was hosting an event. I wasn't facilitating, but I think it, mm. but it kind of sticks in my head and it was pretty special for me. Was I was moderating, sometimes people have me uh, moderate like panels and discussions and stuff like that. And this was at, um, the University of Toronto, and I forget what it was, but it was like a fairly embarrassed, I don't remember the name of it. It was some like reasonably prestigious like annual thing that they do where they bring in and they bring a bunch of experts and they have a panel. And I think usually the guy who, the moderator, will be like some, you know, luminary or whatever. And like, they had me do, be the moderator. And I was like, oh, this is fun. And I liked it. And I talked to them a lot about it and we planned it. We worked really hard on it. And it was a really fun conversation. It went, I thought it went great. And they said, we really want you to be conversational and talk with these people. And they said, you know, we can keep it. And then at the end of it, I said, I went to the audience and I was like, are there any questions? And somebody in the audience raised their hand. They said, yeah, I have a question. I said, what's your question? I said, yeah, my question is, how come the moderator talked so much? And I was like, what do you mean? They were like, you completely like ruined the panel. Like there were these really smart people and all you did was like talk, talk, talk. And it was like, oh my gosh. And it was so exciting. because like when you go on stage, like your fear is like, what if they hate me? Like every time you go on stage, you're like, yeah. what if they hate me? And I was like, and basically that was it. I was like, does anybody have any questions? And someone's like, yeah, I have a question. You oh suck. My That's my question. My question is, you suck. And I was like, huh. And it was amazing because it was super liberating. Because as soon as you hear that, you're like, whatever. Like, you know, like all of a yeah. sudden, like your sort of greatest fear comes true. And you're like, oh, this is not bad at all. This is actually kind of cool so I was like tell me what you know like I was like tell me why you think that and he was like this this and this and I was like I was like ah, I'm really sorry you know and I said I said I said look you know for me I, I try and walk a line between keeping this thing conversational and not overstepping that bounds and if, if you feel like you overstep that bounds I'm, I'm sorry and I was like who else in the audience feels that way I'm like four hands went up and I was like I was like who doesn't I'm like all the other hands went up I, was like, hey, well, you know, <laughs> I didn't make that guy happy and I'm sorry and he went on and you know but like having that moment of just like mm -hmm just the, the basic thing that you fear. I mean, I guess it wasn't as bad. Like, I guess the thing you really fear is that everyone would be you suck, you know, but, but that sort of fear of like, just the audience just being like, we just hate you. <laughs> I think I felt, I never was someone who had, I never was someone who had like a lot of stage fright or a lot of fear in front of groups, but I think any fear that I had after that, I was like, oh, right. The worst thing that can happen is someone's going to tell you you suck. And then you're just like, oh. you know. Yeah. Wow. And he did, he did a really, I mean, he had the microphone and just, oh gosh, on my show the other week with Alan Weiss, he was talking about uh, talking to, to uh, getting referrals and stuff. And he goes, just remember, you're not being shot at. Like the worst thing that can happen is, you know, worse off than you were when you walked in. You've learned a lesson. Incredible thing about humans, man. Like when you think about mm. how, yeah, how scary that is for us. And like, yeah. like we're scared of heights. And you, if you think about why we're scared of heights, we're like, that makes sense. Like, you could fall, you could die. Like the fact that, but like just the degree to which we're afraid of groups of people or the degree to which we're afraid of rejection. Yeah. Quite remarkable. And if you try to work through like why, it's like, it's really weird. Deep evolutionary reasons that don't make sense. That aren't so logical. Yeah. And it can really hold people back from doing the things that they, you know, want to try or um, putting themselves out there. So advice for first time facilitators, if you had to go back all that time and, you know, share some advice to your younger self about running workshops, meetings, great experiences, what do you think you would tell yourself? Self. I think worry less about getting it right. You know, I think, yeah. wor I think worry less about getting it right. Take on less. You know what I think? I think a better way of putting that is, which I think is even more productive, is um, take on less ownership for the outcome. Ooh, that's powerful. Not your, yeah. It's not your outcome. And and once you do that, that means all kinds of things. It means you can prepare less. It also means you can fret less about like whether you're going to do a great job because ultimately it, it's kind of their job to do anyhow. You know all that. Awesome. That's, that's wonderful. I, I love all this. And it really resonates with what we talked about Michael at the beginning. I think your mates with him in Toronto yeah. talks about being more lazy as well. And I, I love yeah. that. Yeah. It's yeah. really important. Man. It's so important. Mm. 
Misha, if everyone would love to, you know, reach out to you, read your article, find out more about the work that you do, where should we send them? Uh, I guess the best place is my website, it's, which is, it's, it's MishaGloberman.com. You don't know how to spell Misha Globerman, but if you go into Google and just guess how you spell Misha Globerman, it will auto-correct you to that. Awesome. Um, I have a, if you like to know my projects, you can sign up for my email list. I have, I'm on Twitter too. I don't tweet very often. Uh, those are the main things I think. Great. I have, a book. I have a book. People can read yes. my book. Yes. What's the title of your book? Cares are where the people go. It's a book I wrote quite a few years ago. So it's a, if you want to know, hey, what was this guy like in 2010? You can read that book and find out. Amazing. Gosh, I can't believe we didn't even get to the book, but we want a few sort of key philosophies on how you organize these events. And I've got to say, it's been an absolute delight talking to you. And I've the best thing about this podcast is I'm just learning every time I have a conversation and you've really reinforced that. Let go, let go. It feels to me like the best. I'm curious what it's like. Can I ask you what it's like for you? Yeah. Because I got to yeah. say, it always seems to me like the best, like the sweetest gig in the world. Like, like it's just such a smart project to do, to be like, oh, I'm going to have a podcast where what I do is just interview, you know, reach out to people who seem interesting to me and interview them because you get to reach out to people you are interesting to. And it's the to. best. Oh, oh my gosh. It's the best thing I ever did. So when I was thinking yeah. about starting a podcast, the advice that was given to me was do a podcast on something you want to learn more about, because even yeah. if no one listens to it, at least you're learning something from the process. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And a lot of people were like, first time facilitator, you won't have more than 50 episodes. Like what can you possibly talk about? And it's like, oh my gosh, it's it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, Because there's only 50 good facilitators in the world. (laughs) Everyone knows that. Yeah. Yeah. And just being able to connect with amazing people and get their time and, and then sharing that with other people. It actually, and and then I guess the, the best thing about it is when people listen to the show and they've tried something different in their workshops, it's like just amazing. It's, it's the coolest thing. Yeah. That's awesome.